Greetings again, everybody. We're going to talk here about irritable bowel syndrome. You're going to run into this quite a bit. And um, this affects about 1 in 5 to 1 in 10 people. So very, very common. Probably not as common as you'll run into strep throat and flu and stuff like that. But it's common and you will get tested on this. Um, fortunately, it's pretty straightforward. And what they're probably going to test you on is the workup. For this, not so much the treatment because that can be complicated and we'll get into that, okay? But this is very important. This is bread and butter gastroenterology and ambulatory clinic stuff. You will see this. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or in the I button in the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. And certainly feel free to subscribe to my channel and you'll get notifications as I put more and more videos up. All right, so IBS, we don't know what causes it. We don't exactly know the pathophysiology. There are some theories, kind of like endometriosis, where there's competing theories, and maybe a little bit of each are right. Uh, but you don't need to know the pathophysiology because we don't know. It's idiopathic. What it is, is chronic abdominal pain. Now, you hear IBSD and IBSC, and you think, oh, it's a diarrheal disorder. It's a constipation disorder. Um, and... A lot of times with these patients, they will have normal stools, but it'll be interspersed with constipation or diarrhea. So they're not constipated all the time. They're not diarrheal all the time. Sometimes they can alternate, but this is really a chronic pain syndrome, chronic abdominal pain. But the, the interesting thing about this, what sets us apart, is that that pain is often relieved by bowel movements. Now, as we're going to see with the Rome 4 criteria, it's associated with bowel movements, but typically it's relieved. So you get this pain, it builds up, and then you go and you have diarrhea or you go and you, you know, squeeze one out. It's really hard and the pain goes away and it's just this cycle and it's constantly happening. This tends to be more prevalent in women, about twice as many women as men are diagnosed. Like I said, it's about one in 10 to one in five uh, people of everyone. Uh, has this, so it's very common. Usually comes on in early adulthood, and there is this weird um, sort of uh, coincidence with uh, psychiatric disorders, so a past history of abuse, PTSD, anxiety. Um, back when I was doing my gastroenterology training, we had a uh, very big Mennonite population, lots of women coming in. The attending that I worked with She's like, yeah, they're so stressed out because of the gender roles and all that stuff that go on in their community. So there's a big correlation with uh, with psychiatric comorbidities. Um, all right. So when determining whether it's diarrhea or constipation, personally, I take the patient at their word. Everyone knows what constipation is. Everyone knows what diarrhea is. I do not whip out the Bristol stool scale. I don't like it. I don't have patients take pictures of their poop. I take them at their word. Okay. Irritable bowel syndrome is a diagnosis of exclusion. So what you're probably going to be tested on is you got a patient with chronic constipation or chronic diarrhea, and you need to know how to work them up. Um, and then everything comes back normal. And then you arrive at the diagnosis of IBS. There's no laboratory markers to indicate IBS. So if you're asked about the best next step, you need to focus on, um, what other symptoms they have. So if they have weight loss or something, we would not see that with IBS. This is the Rome criteria. We kind of already talked about this, but this is recurrent abdominal pain that has to happen at least one day a week for three months, every week for three months. And then they need to have two or more of the following. So it's got to be related to defecation, um, associated with a change in frequency of stool. Remember that the normal amount you should be stooling is three times per week at the least to three times per day at the most. And then it's associated with a change in form or appearance of stool. So Bristol 1, 2, or 5, 6. You can whip out your Bristol stool scale if you want. I don't care. All right. So um, now this has to be three months consecutive, but the first time that they experience the symptoms has to be at least six months ago. So this is a chronic thing. All right. Uh, so this is an algorithm that you can use if you want. All right, so the history here is chronic pain, it's diarrhea and constipation, and you have to rule other causes out. That's probably how you're going to get tested. This is always painful, and there's never constitutional signs. They're never going to have weight loss. 
They're never going to have fever. They're never going to have blood in their stool. It's not going to be frothy or fatty. Um, there's no changes to the stool other than it might be diarrheal or it might be hard and lumpy. Um, so when you see these patients for the first time, your physical exam is typically going to be normal. Uh, but what you need to do is you need to rule out other causes of chronic diarrhea and chronic constipation. I have videos on those. You can go back and watch if you want. Those are very important. You need to work, know how to work up chronic diarrhea and chronic constipation. It gets tested all the time. If you were to get stool studies, they would be normal. If you were to get a colonoscopy, it would be normal. Um, and there's no correlation with dairy. However, dairy can exacerbate it, but not all the time. Okay, so it's kind of tricky here um, with lactose intolerance, which is absolutely a cause of chronic diarrhea. What you would expect to see with that is that they take dairy and then one or two hours later, They've got major flatulence, explosive diarrhea. That's not what we would see with IBS. Um, that's more of a chronic thing. Um, dairy can worsen it, but even when they're not having dairy, they still have it. Uh, the treatment is individualized based on the symptoms. There's something called a low FODMAP diet. It doesn't hurt to know that it exists. You won't be tested on it. And the role of fiber is unclear. Um, but if you do have them uh, increase the fiber in their diet, make sure it's soluble fiber. Okay, so oat bran. This is the FODMAP foods. There's really no rhyme or reason to this, but I put it here for completion's sake. You should know your differential for chronic diarrhea and chronic constipation. So if you're thinking IBSD, what you need to think of is all these things. So lactose intolerance, based on your history, I put it at the top because it's very common. Celiac disease, get an anti-TTG. That's part of your basic workup. Inflammatory bowel disease. I always get a stool guaiac test when I've got a patient with diarrhea or constipation. Any GI symptom, okay? Because if you go in and you have a negative stool guaiac test, you know there's no bleeding anywhere. Okay, so there's a number of things that can cause us. Again, I have videos on chronic diarrhea and on constipation. The treatment, there are two cornerstones. So dietary and lifestyle modifications, we want to avoid any identified trigger foods, so caffeine and dairy, um, and then psychotherapy if they have psychiatric comorbidities. For diarrhea, typically we go with loperamide. It's an anti-diarrheal. That's starting to become controversial. Some of the gastroenterologists are saying maybe that's not the best drug to go for, but on step uh, two and three, go for that one. For constipation, uh, we generally go with polyethylene glycol. It is a laxative. It works really well. Um, now, there are a few other ones. Um, so a new anti-diarrheal is called elidoxaline, and uh, this is still trademarked, so it's Viberzy. Um, and then uh, there are some other ones for constipation. Uh, linaclotide is very, very common nowadays. Um, and this is called Linzess. I believe it's still under trademark, but not for much longer. And then Tenapinor. This is called Ipsrella. Okay. So these are some new ones. You probably won't be tested on this. So no for diarrhea, it's loperamide. For constipation, it's polyethylene glycol. Now we also need to treat their pain. Okay, the diarrhea and the constipation is a pain in the butt, literally, uh, but uh, for the pain, we need to do something about that. And the best thing to go for first is peppermint oil. I am not a hippie. This comes from the American College of Gastroenterologists. Okay, peppermint oil is very effective. You can take that as a lozenge or as drops. Peppermint oil works. If that's not enough, then you can move on to antispasmodics um, like dicyclamine and hyoscyamine. TCAs, um, are more second or third line, uh, but you can know that they do play a role. Here's an algorithm for you. All right, so to recap, IBS is chronic abdominal pain associated with changes in bowel habits and pain that changes with bowel movements, usually improves. Symptoms have to be at least three months with onset at least six months ago. On your exam, you should know that your minimal testing is going to be CBC and TSH. And then depending on whether it's diarrhea or constipation, your workup is going to be different. So if it's chronic diarrhea, what I would start out with is a stool guaiac. If there's no blood, you're probably not dealing with IBD. Um, and then consider celiac, get an anti-TTG and lactose intolerance, have them on a food diary. Uh, if it's chronic constipation, you want to consider hypothyroidism, get thyroid function tests, lifestyle, uh, maybe they're not moving around too much, um, and then drugs uh, like uh, opiates. 
Alarm symptoms you should be familiar with, weight loss, bloody stools, older than 50, family history of IBD, these patients should be going off for colonoscopy, okay? And if you give fiber, make sure it's soluble fiber. And like I said, IBS, purely clinical diagnosis and one of exclusion, so make sure you're working things up and excluding the more severe causes before you slap the IBS label on them.